Johnny and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business? We can help. And King of Floors, your vinyl, laminate, and engineered flooring superstore. It's Wednesday, just ahead of Thomas Drance. All of our guests today sponsored by the O's marketing team at Royal LePage. They will find your next home in Nanaimo, Nanus Bay, Parksville, and Qualicum Beach. Found a, find out more at wearerealestate.com. Donnie and Dolly as a whole presented by Able Auctions. If you have assets, inventory, or equipment that you need to sell, email sales at ableauctions.ca. And King of Floors, your vinyl, laminate, and engineered flooring superstore. King of Floors. You wanted to say something. Yeah, I want to get this in. A uh, uh, buddy of mine, Rick Nickel, a uh, longtime NHL scout, just texted me. Uh, great point by Donnie. I hate to read this. This is disgusting. Great point by Love Donnie. Uh, <laughs> great hockey players don't necessarily mean that you can evaluate talent, value, draft skills, any part of building a winner from behind the scenes. Uh, that's uh, Rick Nickel, my good pal, NHL scout. Uh, I, and he's on your side. Okay. He's supporting you. So I know this is this is getting off the subject a bit, but you know I'm involved in Port Moody minor hockey, and there's some just incredible uh, coaches out there at the rep level, and I like through the years I just can't believe how these guys will look at somebody. These are guys who don't they're not they're not NHL scouts or associated with an NHL team. They'll they'll look at a kid early and go, "Yep," and I'll go, "Why are we even talking about that? Yeah. Kid, that kid looks awful." And then eventually you see what they, they, they see, but they see it early. Yeah. It's really really a, a skill, really, really oh, a talent, oh, sure, and vice versa, sure. too. Oh, 100%. Okay. Uh, let's bring in Thomas Drance. He covers the Canucks uh, for the Athletic. Uh, Thomas, thanks for doing this. I wonder if you could give us a blow-by-blow blow of last night's uh, or yesterday's 4-2 Canuck win. <laughs> we got Thomas? Thomas. Yes. Hey, bud. Thomas, we need to know about the hockey game played yesterday. Yeah. Ta- your, give us a period-by-period period, uh, description of it. Well, as uh, the game went on and I drafted a thousand words and chatted on the phone with you, Rick. Yes. Uh, occasionally, I'd look up and ask Carmen Dial, who scored? <laughs> 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 Spent the whole game on the phone. It was a very weird experience, but things were moving quickly yesterday afternoon. Um, okay. You know, and it wasn't just Will Lockwood's disruptive forechecking. Yes. A bright spot yes. in this season. <laughs> All right, Thomas. So, what what do you believe when it comes to Jim Benning, the Sedins, Jeff Cortnall, etc.? Oh boy, let's oh boy. Uh, let's A unpack this. Yeah. Let's unpack this. I think it's important to note that just off of what we have publicly. So this is this is nothing nothing that I'm reporting. But you know, you had Arthur Griffiths on yesterday, and mm-hmm. he said he talked to Canucks ownership. Yep. Uh, Jeff Cortnall talked to Canucks ownership and mentioned that there have been others. Uh, we know that Henrik and Daniel have talked to Canucks ownership over the pa- course of the past 10 days. So while the club has retained Jim Benning, we also know that they solicited a ton of opinions from a variety of people in the local hockey community about the direction of the franchise. So, you know, that suggests to me that while the club has decided to move forward with stability at the top of their hockey operations pyramid, you know, certainly they considered other options. They considered other routes. They listened to a variety of different people and and got their take on what the franchise needed. Uh, You know, that's a really interesting marker to me because it does suggest anyway that at the very least the club and club leadership is aware that, you know, what what occurred this season was well below expectations, uh, well below any reasonable standard, and that some sort of change is needed if only to mollify the public. And, you know, I think that's a fascinating sort of uh, dynamic because with Benning, we've got from February his declared timeline for for this team, right? Two years away, Mm -hmm. right? Two more years. Need to hurdle some of this bad money or inefficient money that's still on the cap this year. And then then that's the year. Uh, But at the same time, we also know that he's got two guaranteed years remaining on his contract. And the logic of that suggests that personally, right, from his perspective, next year is all important, and probably, gentlemen, the first part of next year, right? So you've got a publicly declared timeline that really opens, uh, a window opens 2022-23, and yet the internal logic of how this club's position themselves suggests that, you know, in all likelihood, this offseason's going to 
transpire with a fair bit of pressure on the front office to ice a competitive team, a team that might, you know, make the mm-hmm. playoffs in a world where fans are in the building as soon as spring 2022. Uh, that just speaks to a level of alignment that this organization seemed to repeatedly struggle to find between the organization's long-term interests and middle management. And, and you know, we're seeing it right here as the Canucks, you know, win out, right, <laughs> at the end of, uh, of, of this season. Like, mm-hmm. we've seen a, a coach, for example, who, you know, his interests are getting every point out of this season because he you know, he, he might be 24 hours away from being a free agent when wouldn't it have been in the club's long-term interests to play as many kids as possible over the course of the past 10 days and, frankly, lose as many games as possible to shore up their draft position. Like, that's just a small taste of it, but we've seen it in almost every action that this club has taken. You know, from the very top on down, there's been an issue just aligning, you know, management, coaching staff, and on and on down the list uh, with the interests, the long-term best interests of this organization. And that, to me, gentlemen, just speaks to, you know, I mean, whether you call it dysfunction or a lack of a plan, it speaks to something lacking in how this organization is conducting itself. As far as the Sedins uh, uh, goes, uh, uh, Thomas, bringing them in or the possibility of, of, of bringing them in, um, do you think that would and use use the word mollify way way too big for uh, Rick sorry. and I? Uh, just uh, don't uh, use words yeah. like Thomas uh, like yeah. that, please. <laughs> don't use the word Thomas. Uh, <laughs> Thomas, do you think do you think that would upset the fans uh, in in a red herring kind of way or please the fans? Well, I think the fan, I think fans will see it as like a smoke screen that yes. that is unsatisfactory ultimately. Mm-hmm. But, but, and I, I've got to say this, you know, I, I mean, I wrote a column on Monday about how if the organization was considering, you know, uh, alumni with no experience, that they were out of ideas and options, right? Like, that's the headline of my column. And yet, when I consider Henrik and Daniel specifically, and when I consider that the conversations are, as I understand it, focused on replicating something a little bit more prescribed, something along the Chris Drury or you know, uh, Steve Eiserman model of, of uh, gradually apprenticing within yes. a hockey ops environment with an eye toward larger things down the line. You know, to me, that's only, that can only be good for an organization. And the reason for it is that Henrik and Daniel are people of the absolute highest caliber. It's not just that they're extremely intelligent as hockey minds based on how they played the game, based on their unique experience in the sport uh you know the the geometric or the yeah the geometric mastery that they evidenced as players it's also based on the fact that these are men who you know have a very holistic view of life right of of the centrality of family of the importance of fitness of you know a healthy way of centering sport in your life without it being all consuming right i mean these were competitive gentlemen but they were never maniacs they were never you know, <laughs> Michael Jordan type people who have a, an obvious hole in their soul that can only be filled by winning. Uh, when you can add people of that caliber to your organization, um, you know, I don't think that can be a bad thing. But I do think, I do think putting them into a position where they can excel is crucial, being gradual about it. And the fact that they're being so deliberate, and I suspect it is being driven by them, the fact that they're being so deliberate about exactly where their feet will fall as they re-enter the professional hockey world in a management capacity. I mean, I think that's an extraordinarily good sign and, and something that can benefit the organization if it's positioned in the right way. Thomas, uh, you said on the VanCast, uh, potential trade requests coming. Unhappy group players aren't happy. I've certainly heard uh, some of the things that you've heard. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. About Yeah. Yeah, are there going to be players this summer that are going to ask for a trade? Yeah, I mean, look, let's be very let's be very clear. I was I was talking about on the Vancast going through the leverage of this offseason, right? And I mentioned Hughes and Pedersen's contracts and I mentioned, you know, the challenges of expansion and then I mentioned, you know, honestly there could potentially be trade requests coming. I said I suggested uh, because this is an unhappy group and I do think and I, I don't even think this is poorly documented. I mean, this is relatively well documented. I do yeah. think that 
in that room right now, there's a variety of players that are, you know, looking at what's transpired over the last eight, nine months since they left the bubble and, and sort of looking at it with side eyes, wondering what's happened, right? Um, you know, from the communication that surrounded the COVID outbreak to, you know, key departures and players that departed the organization, you know, upset with how they were communicated with or upset by the offers that were made to them. You know, you have Thatcher Demko the other day going going to bat for his coaching staff. And, and Demko is not among, you know, the players that I think we're looking at as being unhappy. But, you know, the fact that he, he felt the need to step to the plate in the way that he did and defend his uh, coach does suggest that, you know, what's gone on in terms of coaches with lame duck status doesn't escape the player's notice, right? Um, you know, I do think that there, whether, whether or not there are in fact trade requests, and, and I do think there's some possibility that they could come. Perhaps it doesn't get that dramatic as things play out. But I do think repairing trust and selling long-term vision in terms of how this organization sees it to the players in that locker room, I do think that's a big challenge that the club is going to face this offseason. And I think it's a central one. And, um, and not, Thomas... just, not just with the players in this room either, Rick. I think, I think with some players around the league too. Yeah, and veteran players don't like to lose. They want to be in a winning atmosphere. And if they are, yeah. some players not happy. It's not really hard to believe. Uh, Travis Green, last game today. Is it his last game, Thomas? <laughs> is there going to be a deal in the 11th hour? I, look, I, I don't know. I don't think so. That that doesn't seem likely based on how yeah. all of this has trended at this juncture, right? Um, you know, and, and honestly, probably the organization's need for some change in the event that, well, not in the event, now that they've decided to move forward with stability in the front office, can you return every leader, every organizational leader next season? Or do you need to be able to tell some kind of story about renewal? Um, you know, to me, I, I think you do. Like, I think you do have to be able to say we're trying something at least a little bit different, right? And yeah. so if the organization's moving forward with the same jam, I mean, we all sort of know where the axe t tends to fall in those instances, right? Um, you know, my, my sense of it is that while there have been internal discussions about the possibility of, you know, extending green, and while some internal sources have suggested to me that that's very much still a possibility, yeah. um, I remain deeply skeptical that the organization's intent on making green the type of serious offer that he would strongly consider and considering the number of vacancies, the fact that a variety of candidates are already interviewing in places from Manhattan to Seattle, Rick, I, I just think most likely uh, the organization will part ways with their coaching staff and, and will need to do so shortly in the event that they're intent on treating them with the respect they've earned. Yes. If they lose Travis Green, do they lose Ian Clark? Yeah, I don't know how connected that yeah. would be. I mean, we've seen in New York, right, New York Rangers – Goaltending coach Ben Waller is about to be on his fifth bench boss, Donnie. Mm -hmm. Like he's worked yeah, for Tom point. Rennie. He's worked for Tortorella. He's worked for Alain Vigneault. He's literally worked for almost every Canucks head coach of the past 25 years in, New in Manhattan. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are situations where a goaltending coach sort of – a goaltending coach is not an assistant coach, right? That's an important thing to note. Like they're part of the coaching staff, but they're a little bit removed. From the immediate coaching staff, there are situations where teams have retained uh, a goalie coach and churned through different coaching staffs as they've gone over lengthy periods of time. The Canucks could replicate something like that, but I do believe that the organization's philosophy on this has always been hierarchical. The green goes first. And so I I'm pretty skeptical that the cl club's going to retain any of their coaches at this point, to be totally honest with you, except perhaps Chris Higgins. Um, you know, with Clark's situation in particular, um, perhaps they get to it in the event that a decision is made on green shortly, but whether or not that, you know, pays dividends, whether or not they can come with enough of an offer to, uh, make that happen, um, you know, that remains to be seen. I, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm expecting, uh, you know, a full house cleaning in the coaching offices, uh, off of Griffith's way, but, <laughs> Perhaps something can happen at the, at the 11th hour with Clark or Green or someone else. That's just, I, I think at this point, it's gone too long. And the most likely outcome is that the Canucks will have a new coaching staff, including a new goalie coach next season. Puck drop at 1230. Get pumped for it. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate it. <laughs> Can't wait, gentlemen. Cheers. Thanks for having me.